me welcome you to our Regis Dialogue, which closes a, an extraordinary retrospective of the work of the writer, director, performer, animator, and Minnesota native, Terry Gilliam. Terry was two days ago on the Grand Canal in Venice, celebrating his silver anniversary with his wife and family, and is here tonight through with a little bit of help from our friends, the Regis Foundation, Northwest Airlines, and also his personal generosity to come and make a really remarkable visit to be here and in New York, and then back in London for the opening of Fear and Loathing on Saturday night. This is not Terry Gilliam's first visit to the Walker. He reminded me that when he was 11 or 12 years old, he came for a Saturday drawing class here and was mightily impressed with the, uh, the level of instruction. <laughs> it was about 22 years ago that he had his next visit on this stage when he was invited after directing his first feature, Jabberwocky, his first solo feature. And he said that he came on to do a, a presentation with a, a very famous British photographer, and it was just two of them that night. The podium was here, and he said he had come in before the show began and hidden inside the podium, so that when he was introduced, his hand went up, grabbed the mic, and the first 15 minutes, he delivered his talk inside the podium. <laughs> you, know, you notice there's no podium here tonight. <laughs> Terry's going to be here in full view, and we'll have a chance not only to hear about the early career when he ran away to the circus or the flying circus, but also the extraordinary films he's done in the 80s and now into the late 90s. Films like Time Bandits in Brazil, 12 Monkeys, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. I mean, he's made some of the most impressive, visually arresting, powerful work in contemporary cinema. And he's very kindly come here to discuss that career with us. To leave that discussion, one of my favorite critics, but I think one of also the most serious and thoroughgoing critics in North America. He started out as a book reviewer in his 20s, graduated to film in his 40s, and for the last decade has been the main film reviewer, the only film critic for the nation. Stuart Clowans is an extraordinary writer, very insightful and very, very deeply felt views about the cinema. And he has agreed to join us in looking at the career of Terry Gilliam. So I'd like to ask you to join us in welcoming back here his first visit in 22 years, and I hope we don't let that much time go back, go away again until he's here with us. Mr. Terry Gilliam, Mr. Stuart Clewans. That's enough. <laughs> uh, this is a homecoming for you. Um, and I know that today uh, you, you actually located uh, the house you grew up in yeah. by Medicine Lake. Yeah, this tiny, tiny little place uh, out Medicine Lake. And strangely enough, it's one little area out there that hasn't seemed to have been touched by development. We got, ended up on the wrong road to begin with, and there was no shape of this memory of mine, and finally we had to call a friend of my parents who had called the newspaper to say she would tell me where I used to live if we gave her a call, and they took us to this place, in this tiny, tiny place. It was this wee little place. <laughs> and you could barely squeeze you know, a couple of people in. There were five of us who grew up in this, uh, and it was it's actually... It's kind of moving in a, in a weird way because I have such a strong memory of the place and the roads and the houses, and they're all basically there. And it's uh, somehow it's the only area around Madison Lake that hasn't been touched. And I don't know if it's because my memory kept it intact or not. I mean, I, I want to believe these things. <laughs> right. They're probably not true. <laughs> but uh, 
in, in a sense, though, Mr. Gilliam is here under false pretenses because he did leave for Los Angeles. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm very curious um, when, at age 11, 12, you went to Los Angeles from, from this area. Mm. Um, what were your impressions of the architecture out there, of the, of the physical landscape of L.A.? Well, it must have been enormously we, different. Yeah, we went out there, and I really did think I was going out to the land of cowboys and Indians. I thought that's what L.A. was going to be, great spaces and men riding on horses, you know. And, 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 and it ended up, we moved into a tract house in the middle of the San Fernando Valley that two years earlier had been orange groves. Like, you know, in, in Chinatown, when Jack Nicholson drives out into those orange groves, that's what the San Fernando Valley used to be like. And two years uh-huh. earlier... They took it all down. Kaiser Aluminum built these track houses, and they looked just like the houses in uh, Tim Burton's Edward Scissorhands, each one a sweet Uh little pastel shade. And it wasn't anything of what I hoped it would be, except except there were the movie studios, and there were the old um, movie ranches were still out there. There's a place called Stony Point out in um, Northridge where... The old serials, television uh, cowboy serials, used to be shot there. They constantly rode past the same trees, the same rocks, <laughs> and that was there. So there was a bit of, bit of that magic still there to climb around and to imagine that I was in the movies. Mm-hmm. But you didn't find the romance that you'd been hoping for yet. No, no, no I still uh-huh. haven't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a life of, <laughs> the life of a failed romantic, is what you're talking about. I mean, the dreams keep appearing. The, uh, the movies keep telling me life is going to be a certain way, and it's all wonderful. And it's not. It's this other thing, which I'm actually getting better at coming to terms with. Wow. Um, I, I'm also curious, uh, when you, when you fir- saw your first art historical naked lady... Mm. <laughs> are you asking me about the Encyclopedia Britannica? I think you are. Is that it? Yes. Uh-huh. Porno for the thinking child. Oh. <laughs> it was, I mean, that was actually my first brush with, with um, eroticism. And it was the Encyclopedia uh-huh. Britannica. And it was yeah. in the Greek sculpture section. And there they were, Venus uh-huh. de Milo and all these luscious porcelain marbleized women with uh, no, you know, pores and hair or anything, they were wonderful. And I was, and I was <laughs> obsessed, with, obsessed with these for, things for a long time. I think I moved on from the Greeks to Mad Comics uh, somewhat later, because uh, uh-huh. Mad Comics, when they began, there was uh, a couple wonderful cartoonists, Wally Wood and Jack Davis, who drew these wonderfully zoftic women. And I, I mean, Mad Magazine or Mad Comics was not known as a... As a porno magazine, but I felt guilty about it and used to hide it in the garage, you know, in, in fear I would be found out that I wasn't reading it for the comics, I was reading it for those girls. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Kurtzman, too, eventually. Mm. Um, but uh, you became a cartoonist, um, also um, switched from an interest when you went to college from, mm. from physics to art and architecture. Yeah. Um, what movies were you watching at the time? I, mean, I was watching everything. I'm, I'm, I've always been totally eclectic. I didn't think of movies as other than what most people think of movies. They're just entertainment, things you go to do on a Saturday mm-hmm. or a Friday. Uh, and I was a huge fan of Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin. Uh, um, yeah. I loved, actually I loved epics. Epics, Ben Hur, you know, the Fall of the Roman Empire, uh, Silver Chalice. Those were incredible because they were the first chance of real escape. I felt from the world I lived in, this rather mundane, suburban, tracked life with things very much as what you saw was what what was in front and what was there. There was mm-hmm. no mystery to it. And suddenly to go back into ancient Rome or, or Greece or that was fantastic for me. That was exciting and. Uh, and those are the things that I held on to as a kid, mainly. Uh, I've actually, it's taken a long time to discover what I watched when I was a kid. It, uh, I, a few years ago, I was at the Sundance Institute, and Stanley Donnan was there, and it was after I made Fisher King. And Stanley, uh, one night, showed uh, a lot of tapes of uh, clips from the, all the films he had made, from, you know, Funny Girl to um, Singing in the Rain and all these movies with Sid Charisse, all these basically song and dance films. 
And I suddenly realized how important those had been in my life, and I'd never recognized them. And I, I'd said, had I seen them before we'd finished Fisher King, I would have dedicated the film to them, because they were wonderful, and they were romantic, and people fell in love, and they danced, and they sang, and did all these things. And I said to Stanley, you know, what you actually did, now that you've reminded me of what you did, was that you ruined a great deal of my life because I believed in those movies. I believed in that innocent, virginal kind of world. And, uh, and he said, you think you've got it bad. I still do. <laughs> I think he was on his fourth or fifth wife at that point. <laughs> uh, and that's, so I, I mean, I, looking back, I realized that all sorts of movies are having a big effect. So I think, again, early movies that, and some that I remember from Minnesota were, um, I think, Pinocchio, Snow White, the early Disney animation mm -hmm. films, which to me, and, and they still are extraordinary creations because the world is so dense and beautiful, the detail in it is just, it's extraordinary. And I think also Thief of Baghdad, the, um, uh, Michael Powell uh, Corda uh -huh. movie with, and I remember as a child it was the first real lasting nightmare I used to have was there's a scene where um, you know the character is caught in a spider web and the spider's coming down on him and I used to wake up in the middle of the night completely wrapped up in all the, the bed clothes the sheets and the blankets and I had been struggling trying to get out of that web and it, that that uh, nightmare stayed with me for years so uh, and I. And I, I think maybe now I make movies to give nightmares to new generations of kids. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very healthy. I think nightmares are very good things for you. <laughs> uh, when, when moving on from childhood, though, when, when we got into the middle 60s, when you were already mm. getting out of college, having your first jobs, uh, you'd done a stint in the National Guard, I think. Yeah. Um, but, um, but what were I mean, I read that you were watching Antonioni at that point. Um, yeah. How about Richard Lester, Stan Vanderbeek? Were, were, well, were you watching any of this stuff? No, no, exactly. There was that point yeah. after college, going to New York, when I basically discovered foreign movies, is what it was. So it was mm -hmm. Kurosawa, Bergman, you know, uh, Fellini. <clears throat> these were Antonioni, Buñuel. These, I just... I completely rejected American filmmaking at that point. I thought it was just crap or rubbish. And the truth was uh -huh. in the foreign filmmakers. And, and again, they were opening up new worlds to me, different ways of looking at the world, different cultures. And that was really exciting. And, and of course, there was Dick Lester with uh, running Jumping Standing and Still film first, and then the Beatles films. And, uh, mm -hmm. and Stan Vanderbeek was doing uh, cut-out animation. Um, and I, I always remember one where it was cut out of Nixon, and he had his foot stuck in his mouth the whole time. And as I thought, you know, uh -huh. it, was, it, was, it was just very funny stuff. And I, years later, when I started doing cut-out animations, I think that was what was in the back of my mind. But Richard Lester was probably one of the reasons I went to England, because I thought, no, there's an American. He went there, and he met some famous pop stars and made some really good films. So mm -hmm. I'll follow in his footsteps. Yeah. Um, I think this may be a good segue to, to look at our first clip. So we're, we're going to look at um, uh, one of Terry Gilliam's early animations. This is uh, from the compilation film and now for something completely different. Um, so let's roll the first clip. Of course, one of the things I admire most about that is with the dancing teeth, how you uh, wait as long as possible before anything happens. <laughs> Just keep them going. Uh, that, was, that was me stalling, basically. I knew I had to produce X amount of time worth of animation. The longer I could drag it out, the least amount of work was very important. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I also wanted to uh, to begin with this one because it really <coughs> brings back the the smell of the coffee from those years. Mm. Um, it's it's really rich with with all the with all the political and and, and social and cultural. Um, yeah, currents it's of funny. That time. It's like I mean, yeah. having left America because I felt I had to either get involved mm. in politics in a very serious bomb throwing kind of way or or get out, yeah. and I got out and went to England, and, and that was one way of dealing with the Vietnam War. Right. Um, there was an incident uh, in, with, with the man in a wheelchair at a protest in Los Angeles, yeah. if I remember, that... Yeah, I think uh, it was the sort of the first political you... poster I did, because there was a, yeah. a police riot. It was the first police riot in L.A. Uh, Linda Johnson had come to um, Century City, which at that point was basically the Century Plaza Hotel in this great vast 
uh, wasteland waiting uh, for this huge development, and and there was a protest against the war, and I was uh, with my girlfriend, who was a reporter for the London Evening Standard. We were on our way to the, a party, and she said, we better just stop by and check this thing out, and we got there, and there were... I mean, it was, it was terrifying. I mean, huge crowds of people who were very jolly. It was all sorts of people. It was you know, university professors, dentists, lawyers. It was a very middle-class crowd, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. And the police were lined up. There were helicopters low. There were searchlights. There were snipers on the roof. It was the paranoia of the police was absolutely terrifying. And at one point in what was a very peaceful demonstration, uh, a group of people sat down and started singing, We Shall Not Be Moved. And the, the police used that as a as a signal to suddenly go berserk, and they drove Harley Davidson into these people. And then mm -hmm. people started shouting, and there was a second ra uh, rank of police behind the first group, and they charged through, and batons were being wielded, people were crashing. And it was terrifying. People were literally on wheelchairs trying to get out of there, being smashed by cops going berserk. And we got smashed up a bit. And, you know. mm -hmm. and it, was the first, it was one of the moments that I felt i got to get out. I'm, I'm getting angry now because this was totally and completely wrong. One of the best things about that was that the Los Angeles Times uh, wrote saying it was a bunch of left-wing hippie commies who had gone berserk. And the LA Free Press uh, actually started putting out free broadsheets, handing them out to um, people on the streets, cars and everything, with interviews with everybody who had been there, which completely denied what the LA Times was saying and painted a completely different picture. And what was extraordinary, by the end of the week, they were so successful at doing this that the LA Times reporters actually mutinied and demanded that the truth be told, and the LA Times recanted and told the story truthfully. And I thought that was an amazing moment, but I felt things were getting ugly, and I, mm -hmm. my reaction to that sort of ugliness is to behave even more ugly, and I didn't really want to do that, so I uh, used the... That is a reason to escape to England and behave in a silly way as opposed to ah. a dangerous way. <laughs> <laughs> what also interests me about this particular clip is the way you, you work in this political side with, um, with your experiences working in advertising. Yeah. They're, they're all smushed together here. <laughs> well, it was kind of like, yeah, I mean, in a sense, the world has become like that to me. I mean, what is news? What is advertising? Everything is, and everything spills into the next thing. It's, it's hard to know mm -hmm. where the dividing lines are. And I think that's, and in fact, I think that's the world we're living in even more so now. It's very hard to know what mm -hmm. truth is, what fact is, because everything is sort of blended together. News is entertainment. Entertainment is uh, not entertaining, actually. That's what most of it is. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, and I, I think that the times it seemed important to say those things. Uh, and now I think it's even more important to say it, strangely enough. Uh -huh. Nobody seems to notice now. Yeah. Um, as, as for the cutout animation, which you did for, for years for, for the Monty Python show, mm. um, where, did you, where did you get all the things you cut out? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just curious about the process. I mean, what, what, what sort of things did you loot to Basically, to get every, everything, everything I liked, I took. And I, I mean, my <laughs> house is full of lots of books. And so, like, in that instance there, you know, it's... Uh -huh. um, the boat is a is a, by Peter Bruegel. It's an engraving of a mm -hmm. boat done by Bruegel. So I just cut it out, painted it. Uh, I used whatever was at hand. Uh, um, things like the little the, the Chinaman, all the rows of. I just got rubber uh, rubber stamp made in the shape of a little Chinaman just, and stamped them out, <laughs> just like they do in, in Beijing <laughs> for real. Uh, and it's uh, it's uh, <laughs> uh, and I was always, because, because the nature of doing the, the animation the shows is I really didn't have much time. I had it was kind of two weeks to do each show. And I, I was basically working on my own. And so I had to grab things and cut things out. So there's a lot of Bruegel, there's Durer, there's um, any painter that I liked. I would go down to the National Gallery in London whenever I ran out of ideas and start walking around and so many things, the paintings started, you know, providing me with jokes and ideas. And then I'd buy postcards of the paintings and take them back and uh -huh. cut those out. So, <laughs> and was, I mean, now I probably couldn't do that because every yeah. image is owned by probably Bill Gates by now. Um, yeah, and that's it's, right. This is what's happening. Everything you touch, I, 
what I was doing, I, I would take magazines and newspapers. I'd see faces. I remember there's a beautiful book of Richard Avedon photographs. He was using distorting lenses. So I was using those. Now, if I were to do that now, I would probably be sued every week for the kind of you know, work I was doing. Uh, we don't own anything. I mean, we as a culture, as, as a public, don't own things anymore. I mean, it, it's so bizarre. If you're making a film... If I go down the street, and let's say there's, for instance, in Fear and Loathing, uh, there's a shot that's taken just off of uh, Hollywood Boulevard, and it's a mural it's a, of Dolores Del Rio that somebody had painted on the side of a building. Now, this is a public <clears throat> space, or so you would think. It's out there for the public. Now, we had that in the shot, and the car drives past, and the person who did that mural has sued the company and got a lot of money for that. If mm -hmm. you... Uh, there was that, that film that uh, um, Al Pacino and Keanu Reeves did, The Devil's Advocate. The Devil's Advocate, right. And there's a scene in there where there's these entwining figures uh, above oh, this fireplace right. that start animating. Now, it turned out that was from... Uh, Rodin, The Gates of Hell. It, it wasn't, yeah. actually. It was from Washington, D.C. It was in, above a... Um, um, oh, that's uh, right. A cathedral that's or right. something. Yes. National, and, that's right. National yeah. Cathedral. And they sued. Yeah. And they, so yeah. we're living in this time where you can't... Public things don't exist anymore. We can yeah. have all these billboards and signs, signage beaming down on us saying, you know, look at me, look at me. But if you want to make a film and use those signs, you can't without their permission. Interesting times. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, well. I'm angry. <laughs> <laughs> well, have some water. Cool down. <laughs> oh, <we're just> <laughs> Uh, we're, we're not. Uh, there may be Python fans in the audience who will be disappointed, but I don't want to prolong the Python period tonight mm -hmm. because uh, I'd much rather talk about you as a filmmaker. <coughs> and so I'd <clears throat> like to jump ahead to Jabberwocky, mm. um, a film which, for the record, I saw about three times in its first year of release. Um, what a fool! Oh, not at all. Not at all. I had great respect just, just, for you before just, we sat down. It was worth it just for the title sequence. <laughs> no, it, it was in a way a continuation of Pythonism yeah. because, you know, the first thing that happened was a foot came down and smashed something. <laughs> um, but uh, tell us a little about how you got to make Jabberwocky, how, how you made the, the transition to doing that. Well, basically, it, having uh, made Holy Grail and been one of the two directors... And have, yeah. it's, it's really simple. Yeah, how did that make, happen? How did you divide the labor with Terry Jones for, for well, Holy Grail? We, we, Terry and I had always yeah. been very close. We seemed to see things <clears> eye, to, <throat> eye, eye to eye. And when it came time to make Holy Grail, both of us sort of said, all right, anybody named Terry gets to direct this film. <laughs> and, and, and the others went along with this ridiculous <laughs> idea. And, and so Terry and I got to direct the film. And, mm -hmm. and then at the end of the whole process, your name's up there saying film directed by you know, Terry Gilliam and Terry Jones. And you're a film director. It's as simple as that. And, it's, uh -huh. and when we were making it, it was odd because even though we, in preparation, seemed to agree on everything, when we started working, it was clear that we had slightly different ideas. And, and at first, it was you know, two voices sometimes shouting different instructions, which is not a good thing for a crew. And so we decided <laughs> to simplify this. We'll have a single voice, so we got the assistant director to be that common voice. Well, it turned out he wanted to be a film director as well, so the common <laughs> voice was a different voice. And so we shut him up, and, and, and Terry basically concentrated on talking to the others in the group, who by then I hated and didn't want to talk to at all. And I spent my time back with the camera, is the way we worked that way. And, uh, and it worked quite well. We got through it. Um, and at the end of all of that, I really wanted to do something on my own. And we were able to get the money in the same way, because at that point in England, there was a time when the taxation was, was really ruthless. If you made a lot of money, you could actually have to pay 90% of your income in taxes. That's a lot of money. And, and so there were a lot of pop stars, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, uh, uh, um, Elton John, uh, some record companies that were looking for ways to alleviate their tax burden. One way was you could invest in films and write it off. Um, and so that's how Holy Grail was financed. And 
Jabberwocky was done in the same way. And so we were in these positions of having total control over what we were doing. We didn't have to go out and sell our ideas to a studio or anything. We just, well, there it was. And Jabberwocky was one of those things. I, I had this idea of trying to make a film out of Lewis Carroll's poem for whatever you know, loose connection we have with it. It was there. It was a starting point. And I really wanted to do the things that we hadn't been able to do in Holy Grail, in a sense. I wanted to deal more with the atmosphere and really, really get into the, the, the filth and the mire of the, the Middle Ages. Uh, and that's how it started. I just, at the same time, wanted to be free from the limitations of what we have to do in Python, because with Python, everything had to be funny. That's what we were in the business for doing, of doing. And with Jabberwocky, I wanted to play more with you know, a bit of suspense, a bit of romance, a, a stronger narrative, and, and those, those aspects. And uh, the foolish thing of all of that was that you make a film, middle, a film about the Middle Ages, got a lot of comedy in it with three Pythons, Terry Jones, myself, and Michael Palin involved, and you put it out to the world and, and don't want to be judged like a Monty Python film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really stupid. And, uh, <laughs> And, and we were, uh, it was treated a bit roughly because they were still trying to judge it in Python terms rather than its own terms. Right. Well, uh, the, the only meaningful link I can think of is the bring out your dead sequence from Holy Grail and all mm. the uh, yeah. dragging through the muck in, in Jabberwocky. Yeah. But um, it's, for, for someone who, who revolts against the blandness and regimentation mm. of modern life, um, your your view of medieval life is, is awfully anti-romantic at the same time. I mean, you escape to a fantasy that you can't stand. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, no, it's, uh, it was, it was, it was, what intrigued me, it was, it was playing with fairy tales, but it was like, it, the hero wins one, the, it, it ends up in a fairy tale that, with a supposed happy ending, but it's the wrong happy ending. That's what I like about it. It's, it he, he gets half the kingdom and the beautiful princess in marriage. That's not what he wanted. He wanted his little shop with a fat girl living next door. That's what he wanted. And I thought the idea of a man with such low aspirations, which, such pathetic dreams, was forced to become a hero and, and at the end get everything you're supposed to want and end up un unhappy seemed to be you know, something to play with. <laughs> but what, when did you fall in love, hate with, with the Middle Ages? I don't know. I think I mean, definitely it's I mean, certainly a big part of a lot of what you've done. Yeah, I mean, as yeah. a kid, I remember in, in Panorama City out in L.A., mm -hmm. I, it used to be take, take five-gallon um, containers for ice cream and cut out a, a slit and make a visor out and use eucalyptus branches for, <laughs> for swords and build shields. I was obsessed with the Middle Ages. Even in mm -hmm. Minneapolis, I was into heraldry. Uh, there was something about that imagery that I liked. I think mm -hmm. when we started working in, in, in films, the, the advantage of the Middle Ages is it's a bit like a Western. It's archetypical. You know who the characters are. There's a, a clear hierarchy. There's a king. He's up there. There's, you know, there's a peasant down there. There's a knight up there. There's a, uh, a priest, a bishop. You, you kind of know where they all fit within the, the, the society. And then you can play with those archetypes. I mean, I've always mm -hmm. liked doing that. I've always liked taking objects that are known uh, and then twisting. Mm -hmm. And that's... And that's, I think, what the Middle Ages were. But I think I also like, I just like the imagery of the Middle Ages. I like the, you know, pre-Freudian. Things weren't abstract. You know, if you had a, you know, brain problem, there was probably some devil, you know, with his teeth in, his, in your skull, you know, sucking your brain out. It was, it was much more vital, the imagery, I, I thought. I think, uh, you know, dealing with dragons, I don't know. I can't grow up. I don't know why. It's so sad. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think we're almost in time for another clip then. Um, talking, it, it's interesting to hear you talk about the, 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 how clear the archetypes are in the Middle Ages and how that's useful to you. Um, I, I'd like to jump ahead and we're going to do um, a clip from Terry's next film, Time Bandits, uh, which as Terry was pointing out earlier <coughs> today was until very recently uh, the most successful independent film ever made. Mm. Um, so um, this, we're about to look at a sequence from Time Bandits near the end of the film, 
when uh, little Kevin and, uh, and the Time Bandits are in hell and are finally going to meet Satan. <laughs> uh, so uh, let us uh, roll the next clip, please. You've got your archetypes. You've just got all of them all at yeah, once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I've been accused of being too greedy too often. <laughs> They're all in there. I mean, there was yeah, a kid. He's got a battle with e evil. You want all those toys that, that you have. Your cowboys, your Indians, your, your knights. That's what it was about. You know. it, mm -hmm. it want, I wanted the messiness of a kid's playroom. And mm -hmm. the architecture is basically these gigantic Lego blocks. And uh, you build things with it, uh, piled up. Uh, uh, it, was, it was a chance to, to do a film from a, a kid's point of view, was what it was all about, basically. The whole world as seen through a kid's eyes. And it, it, it grew from that, because I wanted to... I started from that premise, and I wanted the camera to be about there. And, and I didn't think mm -hmm. a single kid could maintain it all, so I had to surround him with people the same size as him. Oh, was so that that's the where the, the, the time bandits came from, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was a chance for you know, little guys like that to play heroes for once in their life. They didn't have to be inside of an R2-D2 tin can or inside a Womble costume, all those things where they normally have to do. They got mm -hmm. to be heroes, because yeah, most of them are almost as tall as Alan Ladd was, so it's, you know, <laughs> it's not a great leap. <laughs> and if he could do it, why can't they? And, uh, and I've always liked taking improbable people and making heroes out of them. Uh, giving, uh, later on in Meaning of Life, we do it with old men, 80-year-old men, allow them to be pirates. Right. Uh, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was all this jumble of, of, of times that, well, you'd done it before with your Karat animations, yeah. but now you were doing it with live action. Um, and the, the film was a surprise hit, wasn't yeah. it? I mean... Well, that's what, I mean, it yeah. totally surprised me, because, I mean, yeah. we'd... We made it, and I remember getting off a plane in, in L.A. when we were about to, to bring it for the first screenings there, and I just looked at the Americans that were hanging around that airport and said, they're going to hate it. It's not going to work. And it went out, mm -hmm. and it was huge. It was, I mean, by today's standards, it's well over $100 million that made it in the States, which surprised mm -hmm. everybody, because at the time, it was a film uh, that was the, the result of Mad Men, because we went out there with that script, tried to sell it, nobody wanted it. So Dennis O'Brien and George Harrison, who, along with Python, had formed a company called Handmade Films to make Life of Brian, came up with the goods. They paid for the making of the film. When the film was finished, Dennis took it out to Hollywood. It was turned down by every studio. Again, the finished film. And it ended up ultimately being distributed by then uh, Avco Embassy, which was the miniest of the majors. And, and basically, Dennis and George guaranteed $5 million in prints and ads of their own money. And we used this, this company as a distribution organization. And by all the rules, it shouldn't have worked. And it did. I also, I remember at the time we opened, in, I think it was November 4th, and that was apparently a time when you couldn't open films because nobody went to movies then. And it seemed to me absolutely a perfect time because there was no competition. And it seemed to be quite reasonable to go. And we did mm -hmm. everything the wrong way and succeeded. So that was both a wonderful and, and, and actually a, maybe a damaging thing because it builds up your hopes that you can always do that, which you, of course, can't. But uh, we've mm -hmm. done it enough times to yeah, fool a few people. <laughs> <laughs> it's occurred to me that you were with Time Band, it's one of the last success stories of what's considered the, the uh, golden age of, of the studio breakdown of the 70s. Mm. Um, maybe our audience knows Peter Biskin's book on 70s filmmaking. It, it, it has this aura of, of, of the, yeah. the era when the, when the rebels got to make their movies yeah. uh, but before everything clamped down again. And Time Bandits was, in a sense, one of the last to, I think so. to do it's that. It was interesting yeah. because the studio just didn't want to do it because they couldn't mm -hmm. understand that you could make a film for all the family. This was before E.T. I mean, E.T. Mm -hmm. came out about a year after, <clears throat> I think, uh, less than a year after. And, and at the time, you weren't supposed to be able to do that. Everything was supposed to have a genre that it fitted in. You know, you that age, that age, that age. And I, mm -hmm. I couldn't see why it should be like that, why you couldn't make one that was, you know intelligent enough for children and exciting enough for adults. That's the way we approach <laughs> time <-minded. laughs> Absolutely right. 
it. And it's and there's a, there's a very innocent. What I like about the film, it's a it's a growing up kind of film too, because the character Kevin has got all of his heroes, and he goes and meets most of them. They all end up being fools or you know, knaves or whatever. And well, not he, Agamemnon. He's the only one. And <laughs> yeah. that's what's interesting with Agamemnon. The Connery character, he wants him to teach him how to kill Trojans, to sword fight and do all that mm -hmm. wonderful stuff that Agamemnon does when we first meet him. And Agamemnon doesn't do that. He teaches him magic tricks. He teaches him gentle. Well, there, are, there are a bunch of reasons I wanted to put those two clips together, <laughs> but, but the, the first of them is because in both of them, obviously, we have these um, big, rather empty architectural spaces in which you have these little animated clumps of people wandering through, yeah. um, which you know seems, seems to um, be a theme that runs through your work. I, even though the, the agents in Brazil, the ones running through, are evil people, yeah. I think you rather enjoy them. Oh, yeah. for, for the way they scuttle around. I'm not even sure if they're evil. They're just, you know, like most people desperate to hold on to their jobs, they're pathetic. They're, <laughs> you know, they were doing whatever the boss demands of them. And so they're evil in the sense that they're not taking the responsibility for their own actions. They're just desperate to please whoever it is there. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the thing in, that, in the, the Brazil corridors, there's only one corridor in that whole sequence. That's all we could afford. It's about... <laughs> The corridor you see is about 50 feet long, maybe less, mm -hmm. maybe right from here to the back. And that's all there is. And each, what we're doing is constantly you know, swinging the camera in, into or off the corridor into a bit of black mm -hmm. and then continuing that move, starting with another camera over on this side mm -hmm. of the corridor and swinging onto the corridor again. And it's, mm -hmm. I haven't seen it for a while, and it really impresses me because I know there's nothing there, basically. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's all sleight of hand. It's just this one card we keep showing you. It looks like a, a pack of cards. Well, it, and another reason I wanted to show this clip is because I love the cheapness of the joke with the desk. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's something that can be, you know, th there's no budget there. You just... No, no. <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, it's an idea. Everybody who's worked in an office knows about the importance of the size of your desk. And I just... And I, and I, thought, I love the idea that he's been... Um, uh, what's the word? You know, he's, he's given a promotion. And they actually had to create an office for him, so what they did was cut <laughs> the office that our friend Harry Lyme is in, in half. That guy yeah. the day before had a complete desk, but now he only has half a desk. <laughs> he's, he's been reduced to this sorry state. Uh, and, yeah, no, it, it's, it's the ruthlessness of, of things in, in the film where uh, to deal with a problem, and they're very pragmatic if you want to you know, put those ducks frequent uh, most of Brazil, if there happens to be a beautiful tapestry in the way, well, it goes right to the tapestry. You know, these are the things you do. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, it, it's, it's very much, there's an element in there about the sacrifice as, of aesthetics for uh, you know, the goodies, the things you want, the, the mod cons, the, the, the things that make your life a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ducks are there to service you. The ducks are also there to keep an eye on you. There's a two-way uh, relationship with, with everything. Every television you get, you actually see the world, but the world somehow comes into your life and, and, and transforms you. Mm -hmm. So that was very much the thinking behind everything. Mm -hmm. Every, and the technology, none of it works, basically, in, this, in the film. There's a great belief in technology, but it's like the, the elevator at the beginning. It mm -hmm. doesn't quite come up to the floor. <laughs> right. <laughs> it, just, it doesn't do it. It's irritating. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's it, because this, this film came out uh, very soon after Blade Runner. Mm. Um, and there were some superficial comparisons made with Blade Runner at the yeah. time. But I, I think one fair comparison is that, that both you and Blade, Brazil and Blade Runner both um, defined the, the, um, the worn out future, yeah. um, you know, which, which is now has be, be become a convention. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it, was that, yeah. it was that idea that you know, technology is just... I think what we do more in, in, in Brazil than they did in Blade Runner is emphasize the fact that people believe and want to believe in the technology that's going to give you goodies, and they never, it never quite delivers mm -hmm. what, what it promises. Uh, and that is very much a product of growing up in America, really, in, in, in the 40s and 50s, when we really believed that technology was going to answer our problems. Right. And uh, it's never done that. It's, uh, it's just complicated our lives. Yeah. 
but, uh, but it was really an economical film. Um, the, yeah, I mean, what, what you're talking about, the, 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 the corridors and everything, and, and part of the, the battle that, that happened over the release of the film in the United States, uh, one thing that everybody had to admit was that this $15 million film looked like a $40 million yeah. film. You'd managed to do it very really economically. We actually, we actually made it for 13 and a half. Uh -huh. million dollars. We shared out the, the, the excess with the crew. <laughs> ah, excellent. Uh, yeah, we actually, we had, a, we had a $15 million budget and we brought the thing in a million and a half under budget, which is crazy mm -hmm. since we started out um, shooting a script that had I shot the whole script probably would have, we would have been 10 million over budget and it would have been a $5 million film. Literally in the, I think it was the 12th week of the shoot, I suddenly realized we're not going to make it. We're in real trouble here. Uh, this is the 12th week of a 20-week shoot. And we stopped for two weeks. And I just started pulling page after page out of the script. Because the script was even more ambitious than the film that's up there. The, the dream sequences were much more elaborate. There were more, were more of them. It was almost as if there was two films going on there. Um, and they were almost equally balanced. Um, and I cut huge numbers of the, the, um, the, the fantasy sequences out, so we didn't have to shoot them, so we saved money. Uh, it was, the whole thing was very strange, because in the end, we ended up doing a lot of the special effects, the flying sequences and all. They all ended up in this warehouse that was Her Majesty's stationary office warehouse. And so it was, we actually ended up in the warehouse for all the paperwork of England, which was wonderfully appropriate uh -huh. <laughs> for... Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> it is perfect. Um, I, I didn't know if we should uh, get into all the disputes about the film. Um, uh, probably everyone here knows, but Brazil is, was the first and I believe only film um, ever to be voted Best Picture of the Year by the Los Angeles Film Critics without ever having been released. Uh, <laughs> a real distinction. Um, I, I, but but it's, it's a long story. There is a book out. I, I brought my copy to wave at you. It's by Jack Matthews, who, who was covering the story for the Los Angeles Times. It's called The Battle of Brazil, Terry Gilliam versus Universal Pictures. Um, and it has the screenplay in it. Um, so I, I didn't want to get into yeah. detail unless you wanted to no, talk I mean, more about long, that stuff. It's a long story, but it was but, the end result was that we achieved mm -hmm. something that you're not supposed to be able to do. You're not supposed to take on the system <clears> and win, <throat> especially in Hollywood. And and we did, and we did it by being silly. This is the this is the mm -hmm. kind of weaponry that they don't understand out there because. <laughs> uh, they understand lawyers, they understand money, they understand all those things, and basically, without going into the, the whole thing, um, it turned out Universal was very much the world of Brazil. It was the most bureaucratic of all the studios. You Literally, you had to wear gray suits, and depending on what level within the organization you were, the, 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 the tone of gray was determined by you know, dark gray, light gray, medium gray, and it was like that. And uh, and because they had basically taken the film away and we were refusing to release it, uh, we were in this situation where the producers said, oh, we've got to get lawyers and go to battle. And I said, we can't. We can't win. They don't have to release the film. It doesn't mean much to them. Uh, it means everything to us. So I said, the only way to do it is to personalize the battle and, and, and not let anybody hide behind bureaucratic responsibility or corporate responsibility. And so. Sid Scheinberg, who was the head of the studio, um, chief operating officer, whatever the title was, uh, who had foolishly got into this battle with me, uh, I decided to personalize <laughs> it. And so I took it out in Variety, which is, in retrospect, when I looked at it, I practically shot myself with how foolish I was to do this. But it was, it was you know, Variety, you open the page, and all you're seeing is numbers. 10 million in the first two seconds, you know, 20 million in the first hour, you know, it's money, 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 money. And suddenly it came to a page that was just um, rim, rimmed in black like an obituary notice. And there was nothing on the page except in the middle, just in smallish type, Dear Sid Scheinberg, when are you going to release my film Brazil? Signed, Terry Gilliam. And 
and this you don't do. And, and suddenly, whoa, the journalists, everybody came to rescue. Jack Matthews, who was the LA Times, basically started a dialogue between me and Sid, who by then we weren't speaking. And, and, and he would say, Terry just said this, Sid, what do you say? And, and Sid would say something, and, and we kept this thing going. And, and I was going on talk shows, like Maria Shriver's show, and uh, Joel Siegel, and, and Bobby De Niro was very good, because he, even though he had a small part in the film, when we needed him, he came to our rescue, and they were desperate to have interviews with him, so he and I would go on. And she would say, you know, here you have a problem with the studio. And I said, I don't have a problem with the studio. I've got a problem with one man. His name is Sid Scheinberg, and he looks like this. And I'd pull out an 8 by 10 photograph and say, there, millions of America, that's the man. And, it's, uh, and, and he had never been treated like this. This is a man who was very powerful, who sat in his office and the world kowtowed to him. And, and it drove him crazy. And, <laughs> And it was fun, and it was, it was painful, because this went on for months, and I thought the film was never going to be released, but uh, in the end, the L.A. critics, uh, I mean, the studio got crazier and crazier, and they even took out an embargo on us showing the film anywhere in America. And um, we started a series of clandestine screenings with a few friends in L.A., and eventually enough of the L.A. critics saw it and realized it was an important film, and... Uh, discovered in their bylaws that it didn't say a film actually had to be released to be included in the competition. <laughs> and this is the year Universal had Out of Africa. This is their big 35, $37 million spectacular. And they're all in New York for the premiere, all in their white, you know, in their dinner jackets and all. And the LA critics announce the awards at its best picture, Brazil. <laughs> best screenplay, Brazil. Best direction, Brazil. <laughs> and they died. And, it was, and the film had to be released, and they released in LA and New York. They didn't have posters, they didn't have anything. They actually had Xerox copies of some artwork that stuck outside the cinemas. <laughs> and in those two cinemas, we did more business per seat than any film over Christmas, uh, the holiday season. So it was out. And, uh, mm. and it was great. And, and there was a lot of people that were calling writers who they were grateful because they thought we had brought down the system. And I said, well, no, we haven't brought down the system. We've made a little crack in it that maybe a couple of you can slither through while they're in this state of confusion. <laughs> and, and, and that was it. And, and, that, and a couple of films got made that wouldn't have gotten made, mm -hmm. so we did something useful. <laughs> right. Well, we're going to go on to, uh, to other battles now. Um, we're going to uh, show a clip um, from uh, Terry's next film, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to show another little clip from Time Bandits. Uh, we're going to start with the clip from Time Bandits. Um, it's a clip uh, where the Kevin and the Time Bandits go back to the Napoleonic Wars. And then we're going to look at something from the very beginning of The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. And I'm going to go to the toilet while you're watching it. <laughs> oh. So, um, two versions of the theater of war. Yeah. Uh, separated by, what, about ten years yeah. in making, but uh, remarkably consistent with each other. Um, and uh, I, I, obviously one of the um, big differences with, with Munchausen, which looks great. Yeah. It just looks beautiful on the screen. Um, and it's a wonderful print they sent. Um, but you had a crane, you had many more people, you had a oh. bigger set, it was... Yeah. You, you once uh, did a very nice book about the art of animation, and I remember uh, you gave your primary rule for animators, which was, if it looks like it's going to be a lot of trouble, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had read that book before I made Munchausen. <laughs> Munchausen was, uh, uh, it was, it was some kind of punishment for hubris. Uh, I wanted to make the biggest thing around, and, and, and we set out, I think, I mean, it's a stunningly beautiful film, and the details, it, it was interesting to have more money, how we could actually wallow in the detail more, and, uh, because with, with, with Time Bandits, we, had, we made the film for $5 million, and uh, Munchausen cost, probably then, probably cost $40 million, so there's a lot you, know, you can do with that extra money. Um, but it's funny, I mean, I haven't even thought about the fact that both of them have this, you know, city under siege battle and uh, the theater going on in the middle of it. And I don't know, I, th I think it's me just making a statement about what is important in life. <laughs> and mm -hmm. somehow the theater and entertainment and, and, and uh, art 
is, no matter how dire the, the world is, that has to be kept alive. Mm -hmm. Well, that's um, certainly the theme of, of the yeah. movie. I mean, yes. in Munchausen, I love the stage set. It was a chance to almost do my animation, uh, because mm -hmm. the cheese set and everything is like very close to my original animation. See, only now it's three-dimensional, it's big, and it's... it's uh, there's real people in there. Oh, not only that, but the, the episode on the, when they go to the moon, yeah. uh, you have all these architectural cutouts, yeah. uh, but, it, you know, but done much more elaborately than... What's than interesting, the, the moon sequence mm -hmm. on, 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 um, in Munchausen is a result of not having the money to do it properly, because uh -huh. we actually set out in Munchausen to the moon sequence. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen it, uh, basically has two people on the king and queen of the moon and you know, their heads seem to leave their bodies at different <laughs> points. And it's it, it very, very simple, it's sort of a Descartes, Cartesian mind-body dualism is what it ended up. But what was originally in the script, what we set out to do, which was budgeted for, was 2,000 people on the moon. And it was going oh. to be a huge sequence, a Cecil B. DeMille sequence with Sean Connery playing the, the, the king of the moon. It ended up... Um, that the film it reached you know, painfully dire circumstances. It was, it was very much like what you see at the beginning, the film and what the film is about were the same thing, because six weeks into the film, we discovered all the money was gone. And um, we were out in Spain, and uh, they were going to close down the whole show. They were going to sue me for misrepresentation and fraud, and they were trying to seize all my assets, my house. My wife was pregnant at the time. And... It was just a nightmare. It was living in wartime. And, and again, uh, we shot down for a couple of weeks, um, like we did on Brazil. I, I didn't have to convince them. They were closing the movie down. And again, Charles McEwen and I sat down and tore these 2,000 people out of the moon and ended up with two. And what happened is that we had started building a model of one of the sets, and that was going to be this, it was a big inverted dome, the inside a cupola, cupola like uh, St. Peter's, and it was going to be this huge dome that was an amphitheater where a big banquet went on. Well, we couldn't, in the end, build it, and what we had was the structure of it, there, which was a part of this thing, the, 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 the ribs of it, and so that became our set. And uh, later on, or earlier on in the moon sequence, when they arrive, there's all these buildings moving back and forth. And what they were was, in fact, the drawings of the buildings we were going to make, which we didn't ah. have the money now to do. <laughs> and so at the end of the shoot, we literally took the architectural drawings, blew them up so they were about that high. We mounted them on plywood, cut them out, colored them with felt tip markers. It was back to animation again, put them on runners, and pulled them back and forth. And that was the sequence. Now, what was interesting about it was the end result was in many ways more magical and more inventive and more surprising than it would have been had I done what I intended to do. I think this has happened more times than not in making films, is that I'm curtailed by budgets or time or whatever and end up having to make choices that are more more original than I would have having if I had the time or money. I'm, I'm saved from my own mediocrity by, uh, by my lack of money time and time again. <laughs> um, I'd also like to, to mention uh, the beautiful performance John Neville gives mm. in the film. And um, maybe this can be a little segue for us to talk about a, a film for which we won't show any clips, uh, The Fisher King. Um, which yeah. you know was was the commercial hit that you made, yeah. um, uh, which was recovery for you. Um, yeah, because it, I mean everything after that, that could yeah. have gone wrong on yeah. Munchausen did, and yet yeah. we ended up with a film that I'm, I'm really proud of that I think is stunningly beautiful and, and really quite a wonderful film. But there was a, it was the only time I've compromised for political reasons, and uh, uh -huh. the studio. What had happened was. And this happens every few years. You happen to be at a studio that the person who started the film with you, who was in charge, is now gone. And this was the case in, in Munchausen. David Putnam was the head of the studio at the beginning, and he went the way of most executive flesh and, uh, and was replaced <laughs> by somebody else. So that, And what happens in those instances is that the new regime has no interest at all in the old regime's films being successful. It, you know, it's easier to look good if those previous films have failed. 
and we got caught in one of those situations, as did other filmmakers at the same time. We were the one that was more obvious because we had been uh, in the press a lot for going over budget. It was a kind of it was a kind of comeuppance for the success of pulling Brazil off. You know, okay, <laughs> the smart guy gets it. You know, he gets his comeuppance this time around, and uh, and uh, the studio said, well, if you can cut the film down to two hours, we're, we're, we're there. Mm -hmm. um, two hours is always this magical figure that somehow the film is going to do better. And for the first time in my life, I did cut it down to that time, even though I think the film is better longer. But they were my cuts, and you know, I, can st I live by them. But what happened in the end, having done that, the studio then completely betrayed us and released the film with only 117 prints. That's all that were ever made in America. Mm -hmm. And you know, an art film gets four or five hundred prints now. And, and it was just a complete betrayal. And despite mm -hmm. the fact that the film opened to reviews and business that were as good as anything they'd had since Last Emperor, and yet they were in the process at that time of selling them, being sold or trying to sell themselves to Sony. And they were balancing the books that year. And what they discovered is you can balance the books if you don't make films and spend any money on marketing them. And so they ended up going in the black magical, for the first yeah. time. <laughs> I mean, the worst thing you can do is make films. It only gets you, you know, they only lose money when you make films. You know? yeah. And so they succeeded in, in all their things. And Munchausen was one of the victims of this uh, successful transfer. Uh, uh. Nevertheless, we do have the film. We have Neville's performance, and which is brilliant. Then, which is brilliant. And then in Fisher King, you had four brilliant performances from from yeah. the leads. And I wanted to talk with you about that a little bit because I think it's an overlooked aspect of your work as as a director. Mm. Everybody talks about um, your eye, and everybody talks about the production design. Mm. But you obviously have a wonderful way with actors. Because yeah. so many people have given wonderful yeah. performances for you. It really is it's one of the most irritating things. I remember with Brazil, when it came out in mm -hmm. England, there was only one review that mentioned Jonathan Price's performance. It's an astonishing performance, mm -hmm. and it holds the film together. But they were so bowled over by the look of the thing and so, mm -hmm. that they spend their, their time talking about that. And that's not, yes, it's part of the film, but it's not, what, it's not the heart of the film. It's not what holds it together. And performances have always been central. John Neville in, in uh, definitely in, in Munchausen. And when it, it came around to doing Fisher King, I was, after the Munchausen experience, I was really depressed. I, I really wanted to pack it in. I, I didn't know what to do. And I didn't want to do a big film. I, I was actually saying, I want to do a really small film. I'll do a film about a schizophrenic, but only one half of his personality. And I thought, you know, this, this is the way we're going to work now. And I was, I was banging around trying to decide what I was going to do. And the script turned up. And it was the first time a script arrived that I read that I hadn't written or been involved in the writing. And there was this wonderful script by Richard Le Gravenais. And it was a script that was good because it, he wrote it for himself. He didn't write it to get a film made within the system. He wrote a script that came from his heart. And there were these four characters that I, all, I understood all of them. I, I, was, I was besotted with them. I thought, I wish I'd been able to write that script because the ideas in it were things that I felt totally uh, at ease with and, and they were saying the same kind of things I wanted to say. So here was a chance to go do several things. Go into Hollywood for the first time, make a film within the Hollywood studio system with no special effects, without the first time I worked without final cut, uh, as far as a contractual thing. And I just wanted to put my head in the lion's mouth and show I could do it. And mm -hmm. it was, in many ways, the most pleasurable film I've made, because it was the easiest. It was four actors, and the trick is to choose the right people and then encourage them to be as good as they're capable of being. And, and I... I, I, it was a, for years, I was always in awe of the directors who were great with actors, and I, how do they do it? And I've, I've still have never learned how to do it, except all I know is... Except you do it. I, but by being a good audience, is all I know how to do. That's I mean, it. I'm intelligent mm -hmm. enough to choose good people who are there already, and then you provide them with an audience that, you know, when they're, when they're tragic, you cry. When they're mm -hmm. funny, you laugh. You encourage them. I mean, my job, it seems to be, is to build this perimeter wall around this playground where we then can go in there, being paid a lot of money, get to play like children. <laughs> we get to make fools of ourselves. We get to fall on our face because it doesn't matter. We can fix it later. And, mm -hmm. and that's what happens. I mean, with Fisher King, 
Uh, Robin was the beginning of the whole thing. I think that's why I got the job. I, I think I was offered the job because I'd worked with Robin on Munchausen, and they were looking for a director uh, who would who Robin would feel comfortable with. And they went down all the list of people he'd worked with, and they were all, you know, working, obviously. And, uh, and they got down with this guy who didn't have a job. <laughs> Gilliam, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> and, uh, and it was a combination of that, and the producers, for whatever reason, wanted to be the ones that could tame the beast, the wild beast that I was seen to be in those days. And the combination of those two things, they came and we talked. And then my first job was to convince Robin to do it, which mm -hmm. I then did. And then it was about casting the rest of it and getting that balance right. And, and getting Jeff Bridges was the key to it because Jeff is like the anchor. He's, it's his film. People don't yes. seem to recognize that. You know, Robin got nominated for awards and Mercedes got an award. It's Jeff's film. He holds the film together. And he, in a sense, was the anchor. Because I knew Robin and myself, when we get silly, we just sort of float off into, into, the, into the stratosphere mm -hmm. somewhere, giggling. Yeah. And... Uh, and I wanted somebody that would anchor both of us right to the ground, and that was Jeff. He was solid as a rock. And, uh, and it was wonderful to watch Jeff and Robin work together, learning from each other. Jeff was picking yeah. up comic things, and, and Robin was learning to act as opposed to be funny all the time. And then Mercedes and Amanda just you know, completed the thing, and it was, mm -hmm. it was a brilliant foursome. Yeah. Well, it's, it's wonderful to me to see how you manage somehow to calibrate the performances because Robin Williams and Amanda Plummer are such high-strung actors yeah. and uh, Jeff Bridges and Mercedes Rule are so rooted in yeah. uh, really, completely different styles and yet you made the mesh. But it's kind of what you yeah. have to do. You, the, the job is to choose the team wisely. Yeah. You know, he was like, we're, we're, we're about to ascend Mount Everest and you've yeah. got to make sure the team is the right team, whether it's the actors, whether it's the, the technical all of it, they've got to be able to work together. And we, it was the first time we had two weeks of rehearsal, so we got to spend time playing and working out things and developing it. And, and, and it's interesting with someone like Robin, who's paid a lot of money, and, and he wants to give value for money. He feels you know, guilty that he's paid so much money. And so his weakness is that he tends to try to be funny all the time. And, you know, and, and so the trick was to say, you know, don't worry about it. You don't have to be funny. You just be there. And we, we worked out a way of working after a while. You know, we'd do the takes as, as scripted, and then you could feel the pressure building up. And so, okay, I give him a couple of takes. Just play and do something. And sometimes things would come out of that that were good, uh -huh. and then we'd go back to the script. So there was this need for this, this, this release occasionally. But uh, they, you know, they were... They were an amazing team, uh, and I just, uh, to me it was so easy, because they were so good, and you just, mm -hmm. don't do that, do that. And, <laughs> that's directing, that's really, <laughs> bit more of that, you know, wow. a bit louder. You know, just, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll fix it later. <laughs> Well, from, from there, from there, you went on to to do another project where this you were the script already existed, and it's a movie yeah. that to me is a miracle, which is Twelve Monkeys, um, a wonderful, wonderful film, and uh, to me one of the most improbable projects ever. <laughs> uh, who would have thought that a big budget remake of Chris Marker's yeah. La Jete with Bruce Willis and I mean, it was part Brad of the Pitt would be such a wonderful <laughs> film? That was part of the reason for doing it. When this script arrived, I said, yeah. you must be joking. This is going through the system? You know, this will never get through the system. And I said, well, let's do it. I mean, there's, yeah. there's this awful need to constantly, I'm constantly trying to show well, yeah, the people out there. Yeah, well, yeah. let's pause and let's, should, should we look at some of it first? No. I mean, no? <laughs> Come on, let's look at some of it. All right. <laughs> then, then we can talk about that. All we right. can talk about how, how that, that script links you with Clint Eastwood, too. I mean, you and Clint Eastwood are the two great directors. Of, of David Peoples. Uh, let, let's look at a little bit of, uh, of uh, 12 Monkeys. This is a sequence where um, the Bruce Willis character has been returned from his first trip into the past. The past is 1990, and which is not where he was supposed to go. So let's look at a little bit of this business. <laughs> I, I, I fear we could spend 90 minutes talking about just that one clip. Uh, I haven't what, looked at it for so long. It's quite extraordinary sitting that close to it. It's wonderful. <laughs> well, it's, what, what I love about it, it's got all the Terry Gilliam stuff, mm. and it's also this David and Janice yeah. people script uh, all merged together. Well, they, it's, David and John are just great writers. I mean, I think 
when Unforgiven came out, I thought it was one of the great scripts of all time. Yeah. Of course, it didn't win the Academy Award, but uh, uh, it was the only one that didn't uh, uh, from Unforgiven. But, mm -hmm. but th this script turned up, and it was just... They had been commissioned by Universal to write this thing, and they're, they're highly paid writers, so the studio had quite a bit of an investment in this thing and didn't know what to do with it. And I, when I first read the script, the thing that appealed to me bo most was the idea of a boy seeing his own death as a man and not understanding what he had seen. And that mm -hmm. just hit a chord that I wanted to deal with. And I, I, I avoided getting involved in the film for a long time, but then ultimately the idea of taking something as intelligent and as complex and demanding as that and pulling it all the way through that system of Hollywood and getting it out using their uh, marketing uh, tools, um, power, intrigued me. And, um, and off we went. And I Originally, when they asked me, I, I wanted Jeff Bridges to do the part that Bruce played, and, then, and they didn't want to deal with that. We went, we went around for a long time and, and the studio didn't like what I was suggesting and I didn't like who they were suggesting and I walked away from the project because uh, mm -hmm. I said, I'm not going to do this unless we can do it intelligently. And then, and then I got a call from my agent saying that Bruce was really interested. And I, I'd met Bruce when we were making Fisher King because he was actually wanted to do the part that Jeff played in that. And we spent an afternoon together and I really liked him because there was a side to him that you don't normally see in films. And I'd also been intrigued by the very first Die Hard. There's a scene in that where he's in the, the sort of building with glass everywhere and he's picking glass out of his feet. He's on the phone to his wife and he's in tears. And I thought that was really interesting. And he said that was his idea. It wasn't in the script to, to show that side, this, 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 this weak side of him, quote. And that really intrigued me. So when he said he was interested, we met in New York. and. To me, what was important, when you're dealing with a superstar like Bruce, it's a very dangerous game you're about to play because they're very powerful, they get paid a lot of money, and, uh, and they believe they're right. And, <laughs> and, and so here was an instance where he wanted to do it. He was, it was at a stage where he wanted to prove he was a good actor. And so I said, okay, but you've got to come to this thing naked, totally. You can't bring your entourage. You don't get any of the perks. He actually, he worked for scale, basic scale of an actor on this thing. And he came with nothing. And, and that's why it worked, because he wanted to prove something. And I'm, I'm very lucky in getting people at certain points in their career when they want to show another side of themselves. And... Um, and my direction to Bruce was really simple. I said, you can't do the, the cute smirk. You can't do the steely eye thing you do. And there's that little mule you do with your lips when you're nervous. You can't do that. End of direction. <laughs> and if you don't do those things, you'll be great. <laughs> and, and it was really interesting for him to try, because he's always been such an external kind of actor. It's all out there. To, to in, internalize it. And that was a real challenge for him. And I think, I think he's quite extraordinary in the film. The, the sad thing, he wasn't acknowledged in any way. There was no nominations for anything. And I think it's, I think it's, the more I watch the film, the more times I've watched it, the more I appreciate what a, a great performance there is. Brad then, on the other hand, was interesting because Brad wanted to get involved. And strangely enough, he wanted to play the part that Bruce plays. He wanted to play mm -hmm. Cole, which makes more sense. He's, that's, he's the more laconic character. And really, if you were going to cast it, you could have, taken a young Bruce Willis and made him into the Brad Pitt character, the, the smart, mm -hmm. fast-talking one, and, and vice versa. So it was interesting to take two people and cast them opposite type. And, and Brad took a long time to convince me, because and, and, I didn't think he could do it. And yet he had, was so determined to prove something that I couldn't say no. And, I mean, the studio think, uh, you're out of your mind, Terry. Why are you hesitating? <laughs> Brad Pitt wants to be in your movies. <laughs> no, because he's going to ruin it. He's going to destroy it. <laughs> 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 and, it's, and, and so in the end, I, I, I fell victim to his incredible keenness to do this thing. And I put him together with a guy named Stephen Bridgewater who trained Jeff Bridges as a DJ in Fisher King. He worked mm -hmm. with a voice coach. And I put him together with Brad, and, uh, and, and he said, why are you doing this to me, Terry? What have I ever done to you? <laughs> said, and here's this, he says, here's this kid comes in, and the guy smokes. He's got no breath control. He's got a lazy tongue. He can't do the part. And I said, well, can you go to work? And, and Brad worked for months. He really worked hard at it, and Stephen worked with him. And, 
And Brad was supposed to be sending me tapes of his progress, which he relentlessly failed to do, and which made me more and more nervous, because we're now shooting. And I kept calling Steve, and he said, oh, I don't know, it's not going well, he didn't turn up tonight. And then one day he says, he called, you can do it, you can do it. And, and when he turned up, when Brad's in the film, that opening scene in the mental hospital, but that was his first day at work on the film, and he just exploded, and he was wonderful, and he was mm -hmm. funny and outrageous, and all this stuff that he was doing. A lot of people think it's too much, I don't. No, <laughs> I think it's wonderful. No. And I think it's a wonderful combination, the two of them, Bruce and Brad, the way they work together. Uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was nice to see Bruce. He was like the old gunfighter, and here's the kid in town. And rather than <laughs> so be frightened of him, I sort of embraced him. And I think that's his way of controlling him, is to hold him close. Because <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> it was very interesting, because the crew really liked Brad. And Bruce normally didn't come sit around the set a lot. He'd go back to his trailer. Once Brad was there, because Brad just loves sitting, loves sitting on the set. Well, so Bruce was sitting on the set. <laughs> it was one big happy family there. Uh, again, it's, it was wonderful to watch the two of them. <laughs> uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to Terry Gilliam for Thank tonight you. and for all the years before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.